Hi, it's Bridget. Welcome to Above Life Channel. The purpose here is to inspire your spirit and to fill you with hope. Today's video, I'm going to be talking about and to, a little bit different than what I normally do. I'm gonna be talking about and to this afterlife celebrity, Kurt Cobain. Now, if you are hoping for some major breakthroughs and some conspiracy theories and some insight into the final moments of his life, you will not get that here. You won't get that here because the purpose of Above Life Channel is to give you hope, to inspire you, not to aggravate, stir up energy, not to make you feel depressed, give you anxiety. And so that's why I stay away from the intensity of conspiracy theories. Well, I try to, let's just be clear. We all know that some of the videos I've done with, oh, let's say Natalie Wood or um, John Kennedy Jr. I had no idea there were conspiracy theories around their deaths. Not really anyway. I mean, maybe I, maybe somewhere in my brain I maybe knew that, but that was not my intention. Woo, don't wanna to touch that stuff. But I am inspired, motivated to speak with Kurt from the afterlife because there's something really sweet about his connection, something genuine and something, there is some heartbreak energy around his spirit, but I also think that he has some things to offer, especially for people who are dealing with things like depression, intense anxiety, paranoia, or other mental health disorders. I think this may be a light a positive light for some of you, or if you have relatives, family, or loved ones that you know are dealing with some of these intense issues, intense emotional issues, intense mind issues, just, uh, I think that perhaps this video may be of comfort and perhaps give you some hope. So that's why I'm doing it. So Kurt Cobain, he's really kind, he's very nice, he's friendly. He's quiet, he kind of looks like he could be my brother, to be honest, um, yeah, because of the way he looks, like we look like we could be related. And back in the day in college when Nirvana was like a big thing, um, I actually had a high school boyfriend, or I'm sorry, a college boyfriend, let's be clear. College, back in the day when I was in college, Nirvana was really cool. And my college boyfriend used to tease me and said that you were my buddy Kurt, that you were my buddy, that I had some kind of a, a draw to you. And I gotta be honest, I'm not like attracted to you or anything. Like it wasn't like a crush or anything like that, but it was, there was something about you. And I think it was this quiet depth of your soul that I felt. And not just through the music, even if you're a music fan, if you are a music fan of Nirvana, type the title of the music, the song or the album that you love the most. And if you have multiple ones, you can put multiple ones, but try to keep it to a minimum, please, because there's like other people that need to put that in the feed. Don't put links though. If you guys put links, YouTube catches it and takes it off. It thinks that you're, it thinks you're spamming me, so don't do that. But put the title of the, the songs or the album that really you just, you really connect with. And if you want, you can write why. You can do that. All right, so I had some kind of connection to you and I have had a lot of requests to chat with you, Kurt, in the afterlife. And I honestly, I didn't realize, like I can't, I don't remember. It's been like 20 some years since I've been back in college, 25, something like that. Ooh, don't wanna date myself too much, but it's been a long time. So I, I didn't remember that there was a huge controversy around your death. And so when people kept requesting that I channel you, I didn't realize that there were like ulter ulterior motives going on there about, oh, you know, break the mystery about his death. So first thing I'm gonna ask you, is there anything in particular that you would like us to know or share surrounding your death in particular? He's smoking a cigarette. He leans forward, he puts, kind of puts it out. It looks actually like marijuana, to be honest with you. It looks a little different, unless it's a, a cigarette that's hand rolled. I'm thinking it might be marijuana, actually. He leans forward and kind of pushes it out. He says it's legal in Washington now, you know. <laughs> he says to me, it's legal in Washington. He says that because it's not where I live. <laughs> this is so funny. Yeah, he's being polite. And he says, nope. Nope, people let people think what they want to think. He said, people are going, he says, people are going to think what they want to think anyway. He says, so let them, let them think what they want to.
All right, so thank you, I appreciate that too. <laughs> Uh, and we connected beforehand, before the channel, so I knew that you would probably not say much about it. Otherwise, I don't know if, I mean, maybe I would channel you, but I don't know if I would share it because I don't want to like stir the pot, you know? He says, yeah, there's, he's like, there's a lot of mind games with that, isn't there? There's a lot of mind, mind stuff. He's not super, super chatty, you guys. All right. So I know that I could, feeling beyond the layer of the energy that's around you right now, Kurt, that I can feel, when we speak of time of death, I feel the energy of uh, around you at the time of of transition or before you know the last um, days or weeks of your life. I can feel that energy there, and I feel like there's a lot of depression. Isn't quite the right word, but there's a lot of darkness, and it feels like um, a lot of withdrawal and detachment, and a lot of kind of like wanting to fall into a hole, you know, just to get lost and and not be here. And so I guess I would ask you, did you want to die? Did you actually, you're, I mean, you were so young, you know, and your career was just kind of just taking off and really doing great, you know, had a few good, good, um, pieces of momentum around that and the bit with the band and everything and it seems like you were kind of at this oh, good spot you know from a musical standpoint he says yeah he says ironic isn't it so you want to talk you want me to talk about my mood or what are you asking me about i'm asking about you know he says you want to ask if i was suicidal he says who's not who isn't Says who isn't? There's a lot of uh, pressures and things, and and I think that uh, people could maybe uh, make that assumption that I maybe couldn't handle my fame, you know. And he says, you know, in a way, you know, I'm not going to call them liars. He says I'm not going to call them liars, but uh, there's definitely a state that I would enter into when I was creating, you know, making music and beyond imagination and it does get pretty dark there there's a lot of depth as you said there's a lot of depth there but so did you want to die like that's the question and he kind of says like who doesn't you know if you're asking me if i was suicidal he says i suppose probably but I wasn't really aware of that. Like, I didn't think about it. I didn't think, oh, I want to kill myself. I didn't think about that. No, I didn't really think about that. And if I did, it was kind of a passing thing. It wasn't really a, I'm going to do this kind of a thing. But that's not to say, I, I wouldn't have been surprised if that happened, though. That's the thing, you see. It's like that outcome, you know. So did I will it? Did I will my death? Yeah, you know, I suppose in a way I did. I created an out or an outlet. Depends on how you look at it. For not being here anymore. <coughs> I do feel like, Kurt, and I spoke with you about this just previous to channeling, is that it feels like there was a lot of so how, how I would describe for the viewers, and, and Kurt, you can correct me if I'm off on this, but energetically, it feels like you felt like you just wanted to be in a band, playing the music, living life. You didn't need the big, um, the big lights and the big stages and the big, it, it doesn't feel like it was really your dream. Like you didn't really necessarily expect that to happen. You just wanted to make music. And I could see you as a writer, a songwriter, writing a lot of music and seeing you write for other bands. I could see that. That could have been your trajectory, you know? And I feel like you just wanted out. Like you didn't want to be there. You didn't want to be part of the the main event you didn't want all that fame and notoriety but i don't think you were scared of it i think it was unexpected to you i don't think you set out to do music to be famous is that accurate he says um pretty much pretty much he says yes 
did I like being famous? Did I like the, the stuff that comes with it? You know, it's pretty nice. Some of it, it's pretty good, but you gotta be careful. That can really corrupt you. You know, there's a lot of corruption and greed. And I didn't see myself really in that scene. Did I benefit? Yes. He says, yeah, yeah, I benefited. But I, but I also, uh, and he's, he's trying to, he's almost saying he's possessed by it. He's possessed by the greed and the momentum and the, and the corruption around him. He doesn't feel like he was, was the driver of it. He feels like he was the puppet of it. Like he was controlled by it. And I feel like there's, there's a feeling of energy of like feeling, he feels like he's manipulated by his own emotions. He's being manipulated and controlled by, by, the desire, the need to escape his emotions and the way he's feeling about things and how incredibly awful, it almost feels like he's having panic attacks, having to go on stage or having to go on tour and, and he doesn't feel like he fits or he belongs. And it's not because he doesn't think he's good enough, you guys, that's not why. He's showing me, I just, it's not my scene. Like it, I mean, you do, you kind of get caught up in this and, and, you, and, and pretty soon it becomes bigger, larger than life and then it swallows you whole and, he says, pretty soon you owe this person, you owe that person. Everybody owns a piece of you. And then where's your soul? You sold it. It's gone. He says, it's gone. There's no, nothing left there to save. You know, there's nothing left there to save. Um, so Kurt, I did feel a lot of how, what I would describe as like paranoia around you. And I don't know if that's caused by drug abuse because I know you um, used heroin and I, you're showing me that you smoked pot, obviously, but I can't, um, I can't tell the difference. I, I can't tell the difference. So is a paranoia because of the need for the addiction or is it you're trying to numb something else? He says both, he says both, both are true. He says uh, the numbing is like, I just wanted to fall. Like I, I kept feeling like I was falling and I just wanted to get to a place where I could just, where everything was just quiet, you know, where there was, no more noise, no more extra stuff. I just want everything to stop and everything just to be quiet. Just quiet. That's all I wanted was quiet. And he says there were days when he just lost, like no time, like wouldn't, didn't know how many days had passed, didn't know um, what day it was, what time of day it was. And he, he lost time and, and, and those days that wasn't, he says, you know, it should be unsettling right it should like freak you out when you wake up and you're like whoa what time is it and you don't know where you've been or who's been around you or what's been going on and you don't even care like there's no it's like oh oh okay so you kind of wasted that time in a good way like you don't have to think about things you don't have to be responsible for other people you don't have to show up at stuff you know you can just kind of disappear and uh, i think that that's what i was trying to do that's what i wanted He's like, I didn't want to be Kurt Cobain Nirvana anymore. I didn't want that. I just didn't want it, you know? It's, but it's not because of, it's not like I was scared of fame. He says, it's not like I had stage fright or anything, but he shows me this, like his heart, like just wanting to rip out of his chest, like panic attacks going on stage and stuff. Not because he's afraid of the music or himself or, but the crowds, the intensity of the crowds, he feels super, super sensitive. And there's almost like this paranoia, like everybody's like, wants a pieces of him like they're gonna kill him or something that's how it feels like and he keeps he tells me that he feels like people are gonna kill him you know like everybody wants something from him and they're just gonna take until um he describes it kind of as vampires like you know like ripping at his flesh i know that's super graphic and gross but that's kind of the way kurt is pretty direct you know i feel like though this energy of I don't want to use the word anxiety because that's not quite deep enough, you guys. And anybody that has anxiety, whether it's general anxiety disorder or, or social anxiety disorder, it's a very, those are very serious things. And those are very common for highly sensitive people and sensitive types and people who are artists and musicians and like this. Not a surprise. That's part of what makes them so incredibly imaginative and expressive because they can tap those feelings and those emotions and their intensities, right? but it's too much at times it's too much and so it feels like that and it feels like it leads you to the edge of paranoia so you're telling me that the heroin made that scenario that was already current present there worse yeah he's like yeah 
for anybody that has any kind of anxiety or anything like you know you do smoke a little pot it kind of mellows it out a little but you go beyond that and you can get crazy so you get crazy you think like you're going to jump off a cliff and stuff and it doesn't matter because you think you're flying and you don't even feel real anymore you feel like just some character in like a video game or something it doesn't seem real you know and the, for those of you who've been in those situations you know that i'm talking about and it's not healthy for you it's not healthy for you and so did you know that did you know that using drugs like that like heroin and stuff was unhealthy did you feel that were there times when you felt that he says yeah sure yeah but i tried not to think about it because i needed it i needed it to cope to handle things and you know i couldn't i couldn't trust anybody it felt like um the walls were closing in, you know? And uh, he's kind of like the bill collectors are at the door, knocking on the door, asking for money, and you don't got any kind of a thing is what he's making me feel like. And, and he says, you know, it's, it's the dark side of the fame, you know? It's the, and he says, and I, we weren't even that big yet, you know? We, we weren't even that, as big as it could have been, you know? And I know that I, uh, I know other people would think that I just threw that away. And, you know, he like leans forward and takes a smoke and he says, uh, I, you can't understand unless you're in my shoes, you know. So do you have advice for people who are dealing with addiction or who have been in situations where their loved one has addiction? Because clearly if you didn't have the heroin, how would things have been different is my question. So if you didn't have the heroin, how would things be different? Let's ask that first. And can you respond to that? Would I be clear-headed? He says, would I be clear-minded? He says, I probably would have found another way, you know, another vice, but my music might have been better, he says. My music might have been better. I would have been around for a while longer, but he's referring to that there's some sort of a, an imbalance. I don't want to necessarily say mental illness because I'm not sure which, I'm not going to diagnose that kind of thing for the afterlife, but he shares that it's, his mind is messed up, he says. And to get that right, you know, you'd probably need counseling and things, and uh, I wasn't really willing to do that, you know? And I felt like I should be able to sort things out, you know, for myself, but if I didn't have the heroin, uh, yeah, it's hard to say. He says, it's hard to say. I. Could I have gotten my head on straight? Pro you know, probably, he says, but I think I'd need some kind of uh, help, you know? So I know that some people around you did some kind of intervention like a week or so before your death, and I do know that. Um, I think it was a week, it might have been longer that at some point, trying to get you to go into rehab. And you didn't respond real well to that. You know, you tried to do it and then you left and that kind of thing. So. How do you feel about that, that whole thing, that whole situation? Well, I think people mean well, you know, and I think the person has to be ready. The per you gotta want that for yourself. You gotta wanna be healthy for yourself. If you don't wanna be healthy for yourself, then it's not the time, you know? And then you're on borrowed time. You kinda buy time. And uh, he says, I would give advice to family, to friends, to the, those of you who are dealing with that when you have somebody in your life that's an addict. He says, I would say, um, try again, you know, keep trying, keep trying and know that it's not a reflection of you. It's not because the person doesn't love you enough to, to go to therapy or counseling or rehab. It's really not about you, but you could make a difference. You, you could. And I think it's worth a try if you really love somebody to, to keep on it and keep trying to uh, get them to, uh, recognize for themselves to care enough about themselves because that person has to care enough about themselves to want things to be different to want more for themselves you know you can just remind them of, of what could be what life could be like if they were healthy and i think uh, he says focusing on the health part of it and i think is important because the whole labeling, like you're an addict, you have problems and you're damaged, you know, so you're never gonna be right in your head, is not something that is going to convince somebody to go to rehab. It's not gonna convince them to get help. It needs to be much more uh, a caring and uh, 
understanding and know that it's, you know, they're going to make mistakes. Anybody, you know, an addict, a person that needs help is going to make mistakes. That's how they got to the situation in the first place is they need that support, right? And uh, they don't know how to ask for it. They don't know how to get it for themselves. They don't think maybe they don't think that they, they have a problem or it's not bad enough or they're not good enough to get help from anybody because they're too messed up. You know, maybe that's what they think. So there's a lot of things, you know, he says there's a lot of factors and he says, I can't speak for everyone, but I can say that, um, For me, yeah, my career could have been different. My life could have been different if I had went to rehab. And it might have also just prolonged, you know, the inevitable, so to speak. He says, so to speak. It might have just prolonged the inevitable. But I, uh, I don't really believe that anyone, Kurt speaking, I don't really believe that anyone wants to commit suicide or you know, to kill themselves, murder themselves, however you want to see it, whether they, you know, do it with a needle or a gun or however they do it, right? I, I don't think anyone really wants that. And uh, I told Bridget I wasn't going to talk about my death specifics, you know, but... Well, let's say, let well, Kurt, let's be honest with people too, and let's say I will share with you all here at Above Life Channel as I'm talking to Kurt Cobain, and you know I'm not going to bust any conspiracy theories. I'm not interested in drama, trauma, stirring the pot, making your life more stressful. I want to clear that for you guys. Heal and clear that anxiety, that sadness, that depression, that energy. But we will say, Kurt and I, we will say that he was not alone at the time of his death. We will say that there were other people around, at least one specifically that I can see. I can actually see two for sure, and there might be a third. But that's why I can see others around as well. So he wasn't alone, so you don't need to be worried about that. And, uh, and he says, I, so I do want to ask too, Kurt, are you in the afterlife? Like, are you in heaven, heaven, so to speak, like that? geographic location of heaven. He says, well, if heaven is Seattle, <laughs> does heaven look like Seattle? Does it rain a lot in heaven? He says, oh, you know, my heart will always be in Washington. I really like uh, Seattle, you know, it's kind of my place and it's my home and I love music. I love the, the vibe of a club and just kind of being there, you know, just being like a regular guy, it's really nice. And, uh, but yes, if people are curious about if I'm in heaven, I'm trying to feel you guys if he is, because he's not answering the question. So are you an earthbound spirit, which means like a ghost, you've chosen not to leave, or are you in heaven or on the other side fully? Kind of smiles and looks at me like, do you want me to answer that? He says, what do you, th what do you think? Kind of likes the mystery. I think he kind of likes that. You kind of like the mystery around that, don't you? He says, I travel back and forth. I'm in both places and many times. I literally see him hanging out by his old house and uh, like the red brick place. And I see him just wanting to be a normal person. I see that. So are you not incarnated? I don't think you're incarnated. You don't feel like it at all. I said, no, I'm not back. Are you kidding? It's like, are you kidding me? Do I look like I'm back? No, you don't. Um, you look pretty solid too, actually. If I had to say on a scale of earthbound spirit ghost and afterlife heaven, I would say you're closer to the, the earthbound. Like you like human life ironically even though in your human life it was really really tough for you like emotionally mentally whatever you like staying close to the humans to the people and i feel like you're here and it's not because you have unresolved business you guys he doesn't have unresolved business you guys might have unresolved business but he doesn't have that necessarily he's like he's okay with mystery he's fine with that he doesn't have a problem with that whatsoever you know but he likes to be around the humans, the people and human life. But he says, but don't tell people that. I don't want people thinking I'm stuck in some kind of purgatory because I'm not. He says, I'm not, in, I'm not really in between. I just, I choose where to go. 
He says, I have a free pass. I got a backstage pass. I can be in. He says, your heaven anytime I want. He says, but I like to be by people. I like to be around, you know. I think of it as kind of maybe a therapy for me, you know. Maybe it's something I can do. I can help somebody, you know. Maybe I can help somebody out. Interesting. So I don't really know a clear answer for that, you guys. As a psychic, I can tell you he's not stuck anywhere. Um, that if he is more close to the human life, um, it's by choice. And he's writing a lot. Like It looks like he can communicate through writing a lot. He can, Kurt Cobain can communicate with you through writing. If that's the way you're, if that's something you want, if you're a fan, if you want some advice or guidance from him about your life, about life in general, you could write and ask. So you could do like journaling. That, that's what I'm talking about, like journaling, have a conversation, write him a letter, do that. Um, try that, because he writes, communicates a lot through, through writing, because it's like this unspoken lyrical, I mean, it's just, it's nice. Like he doesn't, he's not super chatty, as you can tell, but he, uh, he says a lot in feeling and, and emotion. And um, he genuinely cares about people, about humanity. You know, he loves, he, he likes this idea of the young people, you know. I feel like, did you have a kid? Because I feel like there's a, a child that you're, I don't know, I should probably know that, huh, you guys? I feel like there's a child that you are kind of highlighting for some reason. I don't know if it's actually your, your son or daughter or if it's somebody that you're noticing and you're, oh, that was interesting. That's kind of random. All of a sudden, boom, I just see that right at the end here. That's interesting. All right, so in the comments below, please be sure that your comments are appropriate. They add value. They're hope-filled and positive and not stirring up controversy or creating drama for anyone that watches the video. And for those of you who are watching this video and you are major fans, please do not read the comments because I, as Bridget, know there's going to be a lot of people that don't listen to the house rules at Above Life Channel about keeping it positive, keeping it hopeful, and they will comment and it might hurt your feelings. And so don't get defensive. Don't even feed into the negativity. Stay positive. Remember the purpose here at Above Life Channel is to inspire your spirit, to fill you with hope because this is your life. So the other people in the comments that are negative, negative people or mean people, it's not their life. Your life isn't their life. Their life isn't your life. So focus on your own life. This is your life, viewers. This is your life. So live it. Just live it. As always, I sincerely appreciate you watching the channel. Thank you so much for being here.